So with your applause, please welcome Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. Thank you so much, uh, Heather, and uh, it's great to be back in uh, Munich and uh, great to be here together with uh, Mette, Sauli and, uh, and Maya. And uh, I look forward to our conversation in uh, just uh, a few uh, moments. Russia's uh, war against Ukraine grinds on. We may be shocked by its brutality, but we should not be surprised. This is part of a pattern of Russian aggression for several years, and NATO allies shared precise intelligence about Moscow's plans for an invasion long in advance. Over many months, we made every effort to engage Russia in diplomacy. And just days before, on this very stage in Munich, I called on President Putin to step back from the brink. But despite our calls for peace, he chose to attack. We can already draw some important lessons from the war. First, we must sustain and step up our support to Ukraine. Putin is not planning for peace. He is planning for more war, new offensives. And there are no indications he has changed his ambitions. He is mobilizing hundreds of thousands of troops, increasingly putting the Russian economy on a war footing, and reaching out to other authoritarian regimes, such as Iran and North Korea, to get more weapons. So we must give Ukraine what they need to win and prevail as a sovereign independent nation in Europe. Some worry that um, our support to Ukraine risks triggering escalation. Let me be clear. There are no risk-free options. But the biggest risk of all is if Putin wins. If Putin wins in Ukraine, the message to him and other authoritarian leaders will be that they can use force to get what they want. This will make the world more dangerous and us more vulnerable. So support in Ukraine is not only the morally right thing to do, it is also in our own security interest. The second lesson is that we need to continue to strengthen our deterrence and defense. Wars are unpredictable, and we do not know when or how this one will end. But I do know this. Even if the war ends tomorrow, our security environment has changed for the long term. There is no going back. Kremlin wants a different Europe, one where Russia controls neighbors. We also know that Beijing is watching closely to see the price Russia pays or the reward it receives for its aggression. What is happening in Europe today could happen in Asia tomorrow. So the war in Ukraine demonstrates that security is not regional, it is global. In this new and more contested world, we can no longer afford to treat defense as optional. It is a necessity. Yes, spending more on defense means less money for other important tasks. But nothing is more important than our security, to preserve peace. The third lesson is that we need to strengthen the resilience of our societies. Military forces are necessary to protect our security, but they are not sufficient. We must also secure our cyberspace, our supply chains, and our infrastructure. The war in Ukraine has made clear 
the danger of over-reliance on authoritarian regimes. Not so long ago, many argued that importing Russian gas was purely an economic issue. It is not. It is a political issue. It is about our security. Because Europe's dependency on Russian gas made us vulnerable. So we should not make the same mistakes with China and other authoritarian regimes. We must not become too dependent on products and raw materials we import, avoid exporting key technologies that could be used against us, and protect our critical infrastructure at home. Of course, we should continue to trade and engage economically with China. But our economies and our economic interests cannot outweigh our security interests. So it's only right that we protect ourselves. But in doing so, we must remember that trade among friends and allies makes us stronger and more resilient. We must not create new barriers between free and open economies. The most important lesson from the war in Ukraine is that North America and Europe must stand together. In a more dangerous world, we need our transatlantic alliance more than ever. Without NATO, there is no security in Europe. So this is not the time to look beyond the alliance. This is the time to strengthen and enlarge our alliance to promote peace, protect our shared security, and defend a global system based on our values and international law. Thank you, and then I look forward to our conversation. Secretary, Secretary General Stoltenberg, thank you. And let me please welcome our panelists to, to the platform. And, and while they're walking up, um, uh, Secretary General, if I may start with you. Okay, we'll, we'll do the handshake first here. Thank you, welcome. Secretary General, while everyone's getting uh, seated, if I may just ask you the first question. And I wanna pull on your, the, the unthinkable, but if Putin wins, as you suggested that, NATO would have to incredibly strengthen the eastern flank, its NATO spending, 2% would be the absolute floor. How do we as an alliance prepare for the unthinkable, and what does that alliance look like for the next 10, 15, 20 years? So first of all, President Putin must not win this war, and that's uh, why NATO allies and parties all around the world has mobilized so much support to, uh, to Ukraine because it will be a tragedy for the Ukrainians, but it will also be extremely dangerous for us. Uh, because then the message is uh, that uh, when he uses force, then he gets what he, he wants. And we need to understand this, this is not only a European challenge, this is a global challenge. I, I, I recently visited South Korea and, uh, and uh, Japan, two close partners of NATO, and they see the link between what's going on in Europe and what's going on and may happen in Asia. So Beijing is watching closely uh, the outcome of the war in Ukraine. Uh, and of course, uh, if Putin wins in Ukraine, it will uh, uh, impact the decisions uh, and the calculations that Beijing is doing in their part of the world. So this is about our global security. This is not about regional security. NATO has already adapted. The war didn't start in February last year. It started uh, in 2014. Uh, and since 2014, we have implemented the biggest reinforcement of our collective defense with more troops, higher readiness, presence in the eastern part of the alliance, new defense plans, uh, and also increased defense spending. And when we meet in Vilnius this year, I'm absolutely certain that we will uh, reconfirm that message, uh, both the stronger partnership with our partners in the Asia-Pacific, support for Ukraine, but also how to strengthen our deterrence uh, and defense. Secretary General, I want one more question to you, and then I want to bring our other panelists into the conversation. So in five months, the Allies will gather in Vilnius, an incredibly important summit. At the end of that summit, 
what does success look like for you and for the Alliance? Well, so success is about uh, demonstrating uh, uh, the, the, the unwavering support for Ukraine, and I'm absolutely confident that that will, uh, confident that that will be the case in Vilnius. It's about uh, uh, reiterating our commitment to strengthen our deterrence and defense, and it's about building the partnership with our Asia-Pacific uh, uh, partners, because security is not regional, security is uh, global. But then there is one other thing that will uh, mark success. And that is that we will enlarge the alliance. Uh, I, I really uh, uh, work hard uh, and, and really hope that by the Vilnius summit we will have finalized the accession process and we have Finland and Sweden as the two uh, new members of our alliance. Uh, Secretary General, that's the perfect segue to uh, opening our conversation with President Ninistu. But before I get to the accession question, uh. President Ninistu, other than Former Chancellor Merkel, you probably have had the most conversations with Vladimir Putin, um, and it was important to keep that dialogue. I would imagine your last conversation was when uh, you shared with him that uh, Finland was applying for NATO membership. But I want to ask you, because your knowledge of Vladimir Putin and you've observed his leadership over the last 12 months, help us understand where you think this regime is going. It's been under enormous stress, and I, you have some of the sharpest analytical thinking about Russia, and then I'm going to ask you that accession question, but I want to start there first. <laughs> okay, thank you. I have heard uh, said uh, that uh, the Russian regime is the same in the future, if not even more of the same, and we know what uh, the same is here. So. Uh, we haven't seen any major changes except that uh, maybe the leadership is more concentrated on Putin and the uh, amount of elite people around him is maybe reducing a bit. Uh, those uh, more from the business side are maybe far further away at the moment. Uh, we have to keep in mind that uh, military is number one in Russian uh, society, in their economy, in their industry, whatever. And uh, I guess that they are measuring this situation all the time, the Ukrainian war, by their military success. And that's the only figure that really uh, that they really care about. And that also explains that uh, uh, what is going on, and uh, I'm afraid uh, we'll continue. So, something like this. More of the same, greater intensity, which moves us to the urgency of uh, Finland and Sweden uh, formally joining the alliance. So, and, uh, Secretary General, I may be bringing you into this conversation as well, because I want to make sure I understand where we are in the process. Um, you were just in Ankara uh, visiting uh, with uh, senior Turkish officials. Obviously, the devastation of the earthquake is, is unimaginable. But we now have this challenge of a timeline to get to the Vilnius summit. So you were very clear, Secretary General, in Ankara saying both Sweden and Finland are ready, but, and we want them to enter as soon as possible. But this suggests that, as our Turkish colleagues have suggested, that they, will, they are ready to approve Finland to enter. The Finnish parliament is making the preparations to do that. President, I just I need the clarity. We know we want Finland and Sweden to come together. That's the goal. But if we must, and if Turkey and, of course, Hungary uh, approves the accession, ratifies the accession protocols, only for Finland. Would Finland walk through that door by itself? And if so, Secretary General, what are the implications for that scenario? Okay. Our position is uh, crystal clear. We, with Sweden, we have uh, made an application expressing our will to join NATO. And that will is uh, uh, considered by member states. 28 of them have uh, accepted us. Then to Turkey. Turkey, uh, it's in their hands. 
Uh, we have got messages, uh, and you have to be quite keen when you hear messages from Turkey. Uh, they may change every now and then. But uh, nevertheless, uh, we have heard uh, them saying also that Finland, uh, yes, uh, Finland uh, meets uh, criteria which they have put, which are a bit uh, different from those criteria of NATO. But um, little by little, they have increased uh, in expressing that they might ratify Finland uh, and just Finland. And even uh, we have heard some voices that if Finland is willing to this kind of separation. And our answer is very clear. We have expressed our will together with Sweden, and we don't react at all. We will not uh, accept or demand any kind of separation. But still, the situation is such that uh, uh, our applications are at the table uh, in Ankara, and uh, if Turkey decides that yes, they will answer yes to Finland, but not yet yes to Sweden, uh, well, that would be quite a, quite a difficult uh, situation. Our hands are in a way tied. We have applied for membership. Should we now say that, no, we cancel our application? No, that we can't simply do. So uh, that's how it looks like. But uh, I want to assure that uh, uh, we, we have done our part by applying applying together with Sweden, that's our will to become a member. And it's in Turkish hands to decide whether they want to have us. Secretary General, this is a dilemma. And I think you've done an excellent job of trying to manage the we want them both in, but we may anticipate a pacing issue here. How do we continue to provide that strong message of solidarity and security, particularly as we get closer to the Vilnius summit? First of all, NATO has made uh, the decisions we need, need to make as an alliance already. Uh, we made an historic decision uh, uh, at our summit in July to invite Finland and Sweden to become members. And then we all made a decision uh, to agree the accession protocols, and all allies have signed the accession protocols. So the NATO decisions have been made. What now remains is the ratification process of those protocols in all the 30 allied countries. So far, 28 out of 30 have already ratified, and then uh, Turkey and, uh, and uh, Hungary uh, remains. Of course, my message has been, uh, and was also my message in Ankara uh, earlier this week, uh, that both Finland and Sweden are ready for uh, ratification. Uh, they have met the obligations uh, they signed with the trilateral uh, memorandum with Turkey uh, at the NATO summit uh, last uh, July, and therefore urge all allies to finalize the ratification. Uh, but I also said that, uh, of course, what matters uh, is that both becomes, uh, become members as soon as possible, uh, not uh, whether uh, one become a member before the other. The most important is to get them both in as soon as possible. And I continue to work hard to ensure that they are members by uh, the Vilnius summit. If I can just add one more thing, and that is that this means that it is a Turkish decision. Because they have two protocols. And, uh, and uh, I urge the Turkey to, uh, to ratify both. Uh, but of course, if they ratify one, uh, then, uh, then, then Finland will be uh, a member of the, uh, the alliance. Uh, last point is that we have to remember that Sweden and Finland are in a very much better place now than before they applied. It's not as if nothing has happened. They are now invitees, meaning that they're sitting at the NATO table. Uh, they participate in NATO meetings. They're more and more integrated in NATO military structures, defense planning, civilian and military activities. NATO has increased its presence in the area. Um, uh, uh, allies, the United States and many other allies have, have uh, issued uh, assurances, uh, security assurances as part of the accession process. So it's inconceivable that there, uh, there will be any military threat against Finland or Sweden without NATO reacting. So yes, we need to finalize the process, but we've come a very long way already, both with Finland and Sweden. Thank you, Thank you to you both. This is essential and as we understand uh, the next several weeks and months, so thank you. President Sandu, 
all leaders have tough weeks, but I think you've had a particularly um, tough week. And I, I want you to help us understand, of course, hearing news reports that um, intelligence had picked up a, a Russian malign operation in Moldova. It, to me, sounded very similar to 2016 in Montenegro, to be honest with you, that type of uh, disruption. If you could share with us what you can, sort of your understanding, you mentioned earlier this week that the situation is still highly destabilizing. Um, and uh, after you share that, how can we learn to better protect our societies from Russian malign influence? Uh, Moldova is certainly under enormous pressure right now. So welcome your thoughts on that. And then I turn to uh, how we can strengthen NATO's partnership with Moldova in these difficult days, please. Thank you. Uh, first, I would like to say that Russia's war against uh, Ukraine has enormous repercussions on every aspect of Moldova's security. Uh, it increased, including the military risk uh, for Moldova. In the last few months, we saw uh, four missiles uh, crossing illegally our airspace. Uh, we have many cases of rocket debris falling on our territory. Uh, we see uh, threats coming from different representatives of Russia, the recent one from the Minister of Foreign Affairs, who uh, indicated that Moldova might be the next in line. But um, as long as Ukraine keeps the Russian army far from our borders, we believe that there is not an imminent military threat to Moldova, and uh, Ukraine keeps us safe. At the same time, Russia is already waging a hybrid war against Moldova, and we have many examples. In the fall, they tried to use the energy crisis, hoping that we'll not be able to pay for the very high prices for gas and electricity. When they saw that the government managed to find the money, uh, Gazprom cut gas supply by 60%, hoping that we will not find alternative sources and that uh, the paid protests will uh, overthrow the elected, the uh, legally elected government. Um, now we've learned about a new plan um, that they might bring, they might try to bring people from outside the country to organize these violent protests and then to force the authorities into negotiations on SNAP parliamentary elections. Uh, there are many elements uh, of this um, hybrid war. Of course, the most damaging to our democracy is propaganda and the disinformation. But there are multiple cyber attacks. Uh, there are multiple bomb, false bomb alerts. Um, and of course, uh, all of this is meant to destabilize the society uh, and to use the difficult economic uh, situation that we face because of, of uh, Russia's war in Ukraine uh, to, to bring people into the streets and then to, um, to change the government and to bring a pro-Russian government uh, that it could use also against uh, Ukraine. Thank you, President Sandu. <clears throat> Moldova has had a long-standing partnership with NATO. Uh, there's now a NATO liaison office uh, in Kizanel. As we think about building and strengthening our partnership, what are opportunities and ways that NATO can be more impactful and helping Moldova with security sector reform, strengthening and modernizing your defense structures. Give us some ideas as, as we continue to strengthen European security. Indeed, we do have a long-standing partnership with NATO, and we are very grateful, and we are very committed to our long-term plans. Uh, at the same time, we did uh, get or the promise for additional support at the Madrid summit. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, the priority now is to have um, projects with immediate impact, and the biggest problem that we have now is the need for air surveillance and air defense. And this is needed for Moldova, but this is also needed for the entire region. So we would like uh, our partners to consider this type of assistance that we urgently need. Uh, because of the um, internal threats of the hybrid uh, war, we also need to support to develop our strategic intelligence capabilities uh, to deal with the cyber threats. Uh, we need support to modernize our border security and control. Uh, we need support for special intervention um, focused capabilities. And I believe we need to work together 
and to be more efficient in tackling the Russian propaganda. It's extremely difficult for us to tackle this issue alone. I think we need to have common approaches on fighting the disinformation, the pro-war uh, propaganda. I think we need to have common approaches in dealing with the social networks which are not responsive to Moldova's requests when it comes to uh, the pro-war propaganda and to the disinformation. And uh, I do believe that they can take us seriously when we approach them together. But this is a very big issue. And as I said, the propaganda, the disinformation is probably now the most damaging uh, element for our society and for our democracy. Well, and your Moldova is very much a laboratory right now of that propaganda, so the alliance could learn an enormous amount. Prime Minister Fikrasing, um, as, as you've now, uh, re-election has happened, you've had an extraordinary year of leadership. I would say Denmark has had its own Zeitenwende when you, after the, um, the war began, the full-scale invasion, uh, Denmark taking the important step of joining the common security and defense policy of the EU, committing a billion uh, in defense spending. What more needs to be done? I, and I think the one concern that I have as we get closer to the NATO summit is we are one year away from seeing how NATO members have fulfilled their Wales pledge of meeting 2% in 2024. We know Denmark will be shy of that despite uh, the increase in spending. Help us understand the leadership role that you've taken through this period and, and how Denmark is, is increasing its defense spending in this regard. Can I first of all say that, uh, Maya, you uh, are really a, a brave European president. I mean, um, <laughs> Moldova is a small, it's a poor, and it's a fragile European country. You can be next in line when we're talking about Russia. And you are standing up you as a person for democracy, rule of law, and anti-corruption. So you are a brave European leader. And of course, all our awareness is about Ukraine. I totally agree with you, Jens. We have to do more and we have to do it faster. But at the same time, let us not forget Moldova, Georgia, and, and, uh, and other neighboring countries. So when you ask me what are the next thing to do, we have to and we need to spend more on our defense. Um, of course, that's number one. We have to do as much as we can to support Ukraine with weapons, more donations, and we have to do it faster. I think we have to work more closely together in Europe to keep up producing because uh, it is extremely important to donate more and to do it faster, but also to be able to defend ourselves, to defend ourselves. But we also have to build much stronger partnerships. And of course, Moldova is, is a great example of this, but also when it comes to the Global South. Uh, because we focus on Ukraine, that is extremely important, but at the same time, I mean, what is going on in Africa? what's going on in the Sahel region. Um, and uh, if we are not able as European countries to build strong alliances in Asia, of course, transatlantic is where it, it, it starts and where it begins and where it ends, I totally agree. But if we are not able to build stronger alliances with India, with our partners in, in Asia, as you said, Jens, in Africa, in other places of the world, we will lose I think the global war on values. So we have to do a lot of things at the same time. And we have to, I think, be aware that all the crises we are facing are interfering with each other. So uh, of course, being able to help Ukraine, and we have to win this war, and they will never be able to win it on their own. We have to win it with them. Um, we have to build a stronger European Union. We have to build stronger partnerships with our neighbors, but we have to be much more active on the global scene at the same time. 
That's an extraordinary to-do list. I think one of my favorite quotes um, from you uh, right after the full-scale invasion was historic times call for historical decisions. And I think that's what you're talking about. We, this is what we've talked about, historical decisions about Finland joining NATO, historical decisions about joining the Euro-Atlantic community fully, historic decisions about defense spending. Uh, Prime Minister, uh, if I can ask you and, and take the liberty also of having President Ninistu here, the Kingdom of Denmark plays an extraordinary role geographically because of its position in the North Atlantic. And the Kingdom of Denmark has been very forward-leaning on uh, an Arctic strategy, understanding Russia's Arctic uh, militarization and what that means. I know this is something that the Secretary General often repeats, which we're very grateful for. Of course, Finland's uh, join and Sweden joining NATO has now the Arctic Council, at least the Arctic Seven, will now all be NATO members. Help us think in your own work with the Greenlanders, where you see this as, as far as building the alliance, how we build greater deterrence in the north, and how do we think about the high north looking forward? Yeah, thank you for, for bringing up the high north. Uh, I think it will be um, uh, for, for the next many years, we will have, we, we are in the need of having more discussions about the high north. So uh, we were talking about the hybrid situation, um, let's not forget about terrorism, uh, the global situation when it comes to terrorism, it should still be on uh, our common table. Um, but uh, I, my guess is that we will see a more fragile situation in the high north as well. Uh, we are seeing more and more Russian activities. And of course, because of climate change, the high north will change in many different aspects. So uh, we need more awareness and we need to, to be physically uh, much more in the high north. Uh, so um, you are right, <laughs> the to-do list <laughs> is quite long and I have now made it even longer. Uh, but that's how it is to be a leader in these years. I mean, uh, uh, so, so thank you for, for, for putting the high north. And of course, um, Finland and, and Sweden being NATO members, hopefully soon, will also uh, be very important when, when it comes to the Arctic uh, region. And it is becoming more and more fragile as well. Absolutely. President Nister, you want to come in? Yes, I see two elements. First, uh, the security both of you. I fully agree with the Met, uh, what he, she said. Uh, uh, actually, tradition has been that Arctic Council doesn't uh, take any opinion on security issues. And, um, well, we see at the same time that the high north the tensions are growing all the time and the interest uh, towards that is not only limited to Arctic uh, Council countries. For example, UK is uh, also strongly involved in security issues. But there's also another element that, that is uh, the environmental one. We have to keep in mind that uh, Russia covers half of the Arctic. And uh, I have often said that if we lose the Arctic because of uh, climate change, we lose the globe. <clears throat> and uh, there we have to be capable of somehow trying at least to, to cooperate or let Russians understand, put them understand that uh, the question is very crucial. Their houses are collapsing in, uh, in Tundra area where, where the, the ice is melting. So they have to realize that it's a common problem too. But um, back to security issues, uh, that is an increasing issue. And I believe that NATO is uh, taking more and more notice to that too. So it's uh, historic that we have uh, two new uh, NATO members in Arctic Council, in next Arctic Council meeting, maybe. <laughs> Hope okay. so. 
Exactly. So I'm going to bring the audience into this important conversation, but I'm going to ask each of you to help with a question that many in the think tank community are wrestling with, and I want a really short answer. I'm going to start with you. I'm going to work down the row. So Secretary General, I'm going to start with you. Do you feel the center of gravity in Europe is now shifted east? And if you believe that, why? Really short. Because we've had a debate that, no, it's not shifting east. Yes, it's shifting east. And then what does it mean? Has it been shifting? It depends totally what you mean by the question. Uh, what has shifted east is, 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 is NATO's presence. Also, we, we have much more uh, presence, military presence, uh, exercises uh, in the east because we have seen over several years uh, uh, a more aggressive uh, Russia. And, 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 and to respond to that, especially since 2014, we have for the first time in our history deployed uh, NATO troops in the eastern part of the lines. But of course, many of those troops come from the western part of the lines. So this demonstrates how NATO is, 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 is together and how we support uh, each other. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and we do that to, to ensure that, uh, that Russia cannot continue uh, uh, it, its, its, its aggressive actions against uh, countries in Europe and, 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 and to send a very clear message to Moscow that NATO is there to protect and defend uh, uh, NATO territory, uh, every inch of NATO territory. Prime Minister, shifting east, north and east with Sweden and Finland, do you feel that sense of shift of gravity from the no, I, I agree with the ends. Of course, uh, we need to be aware of the current situation. So, so we have supported, I mean, all the decisions that has been taken when it comes to the eastern flank, and uh, probably we we will have to stay there for a, a period of of, of time. Um, but I think what is <coughs> so important about NATO is that. Um, NATO is flexible in its way of thinking, in our way of thinking. Um, so, of course, now uh, the situation is about Ukraine and, uh, unfortunately, maybe also other neighboring countries. But at the same time, we are able to work with uh, the cyber hybrid uh, situation. Um, and as I said before, I think we need more focus in the south uh, because of, of the very, very uh, difficult situation, especially in Sahel uh, region. But um, I think the most important thing is that uh, we are uh, flexible in our way of thinking and we are able, uh, as NATO, to move very fast when something occurs in, in front of us. President Sandu, do you feel that shift to the east? I do believe that because of this war, my country is now already part of Europe's security belt. Uh, we have been helping with the refugees, with the solidarity lanes, and we are trying to become a provider of security. We need help uh, to become a more serious provider of security for the region. President Nisti? Well, I think it's quite natural that we are now <coughs> a bit uh, eastwards because of the Ukrainian war. Uh, but uh, I would also point out a certain kind of flexibility. Uh, surely we have to be prepared to react wherever there's a problem. And uh, north, yes, Arctic area, Russian border, yes, Black Sea, maybe even uh, Mediterranean. So uh, to be ready to react to whatever, that's the lesson I guess we have uh, got during the past year. So the answer to the think tanks is the center of gravity is flexibility and being where we need to be. Okay. All right, we have some great questions coming forward. And let me turn the microphone here, right down the front with Alexei. Please introduce yourself and direct your question to the panelists. Thank you very much. My name is Alexei Goncharenko, a member of Ukrainian Parliament. And uh, the topic of this panel is building the alliance, right? And I think the building of the alliance will be always incomplete without Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia. So I have two questions from this. First to Secretary General Stoltenberg. Uh, this year, NATO summit in Vilnius, will there be a strong and clear signal that Ukraine will be a member of NATO, maybe by providing membership action plan or just by statement, but clear and strong that NATO is waiting Ukraine. And the second question is to President Sandu. Uh, maybe it's the time for Moldova to revise the policy of neutrality. I understand that it's not just your decision, but I'm very much interested in what you personally think about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Secretary General. 
So NATO's position on uh, membership for Ukraine is unchanged. Uh, we agreed back in 2008 that uh, Ukraine will become a member of the alliance, and that is uh, still our position. Then, of course, what matters now is to ensure that Ukraine prevails as a sovereign independent state, because without having Ukraine as a sovereign independent state, there's no way to discuss any kind of relationship between NATO and Ukraine in the future. So the urgent need is to provide military support, as NATO allies and partners are doing every day. Uh, in, in that context, I also welcome the, the, the initiative from Prime Minister Sunak to actually have a discussion about um, the framework we need uh, to ensure an, uh, uh, an enduring peace after this war ends. Uh, because when the war ends, we need to make sure that uh, history doesn't repeat itself, that Russia doesn't uh, continue to invade Ukraine. Because this is a pattern. It started in, 20, in 2008 with the invasion of, uh, of Georgia, and then in 2014, uh, Crimea and Donbass, and then in, in last year, the full-fledged invasion of uh, Ukraine. And we cannot allow Russia to uh, continue to chip away uh, European security, and we need to break uh, the circle of Russian aggression against uh, European countries. And, and therefore, we need, uh, when... Uh, uh, this war ends to uh, establish some kind of framework that uh, ensures that Russia's aggression doesn't uh, continue. President Sandu. Yes. Um, looking at what Russia does to Ukraine today, it's clear that neutrality cannot defend us. Neutrality can defend only when the other countries respect it. But you know that today there is no popular support, enough uh, popular support uh, to change that. And, and we know that, we understand that, and uh, we acknowledge the situation. We can discuss why is that, and I think the Russian propaganda is to a big extent uh, to be blamed for that. Uh, for instance, today the, one of the lines of the Russian propaganda is that Neutrality means that the country should not strengthen the defense sector, which doesn't make any sense. But unfortunately, there are many people in Moldova who are scared of the war, and they uh, buy this kind of propaganda. So that's why I thought that we need to, to work together to um, uh, deal with this, to counter this propaganda. But given the situation, as I said, there is no question now about changing the neutrality, but definitely Moldova should be helped to strengthen its uh, defense sector, and Moldova should be part of the new European security ar architecture. Thank you so much. I see back, back there Tobias Elwood, if we can have a microphone right there, if you can follow my finger. And this will be the last question, because I have one closing question for this panel. Tobias. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Secretary General, I think you summed up the situation by saying Putin uh, enjoys using force and gets away with it. And if we don't stand up to Putin, then he exploits our weakness. You've heard on the stage the president of Moldova. It almost feels like we're going through this all again after Ukraine. Could I ask what more we could do internationally to support Moldova? Because that could very much be next. I was one of the first people, indeed, at this conference last year to say that NATO countries or the Joint Expeditionary Force should be sending uh, forces to Ukraine to prevent Russia's invasion. But we blinked. We were spooked by Russia's rhetoric. So my question is here. You've heard from the Prime Minister of Denmark as well, stating the difficulties that Moldova is now facing. Yes, of course, we need to pressurize and support Ukraine. But Moldova clearly could be next. What more can we do internationally? What more can NATO do? What more can the Joint Expeditionary Force do to support Moldova now before it's too late? <clears throat> Prime Minister Ferguson, I, I want to turn that question to you as you were thinking. What can we do? And then Secretary General, if you have some thoughts on that as well. No. Should I start? No. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think uh, Jens can answer when it comes to what we can do in, in the NATO frame, but I would like to add what we can do politically. Because what you said is very important that you have a, a, big, a big minority of your population that actually supports Russia because of fake news and, 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 and the war Russia is, 
is into when it comes to, to the medias and, and so on. And we can only, as leaders, we can only support Ukraine and Moldova if we have the support of our populations. Because we are democracies. And when we are delivering, like Denmark, our whole artillery to Ukraine, it demands support from our populations. So I think fighting inflation, working with Moldova when it comes to energy. You are not producing any energy on your own. And I think you told me that the prices of gas has been seven doubled. Seven doubled in a very, very poor European country. So I mean, if you are an ordinary family in Moldova facing that your bills have been seven doubled, you could maybe feel then it would be better to have Russia to help us or to be a part of our daily life. So I mean, bringing economic development into our partner countries and never to forget the global south. I, I, I really want, wanted this perspective because I mean, the food crisis and the energy crisis is working against us when it comes to the situation in, in Ukraine. So of course, there's something we can do when it comes to protect Moldova, but at the same time, we need to help to develop Moldova to, to, to make sure that the population supports the European perspective, both when it comes to NATO and when it comes to the European Union. I think this is at least as important as the hard um, measures that I guess Jens will, will talk about as well. So first of all, I agree uh, fully with uh, Meta. Uh, we, we need to provide support and different types of support to Moldova as soon as uh, possible. Uh, uh, Georgia and uh, Ukraine, uh, two other countries which are uh, vulnerable for uh, Russian aggression as they experience Russian aggression, they aspire for NATO membership. Uh, Moldova has not uh, made a decision to aspire for NATO membership, and of course we uh, totally respect uh, that. Uh, but I think if there's any uh, lesson uh, or an additional lesson to be learned from the, uh, the, the war in Ukraine is that we need to support uh, countries which are vulnerable for Russian aggression uh, uh, as fast and as soon as possible now. Uh, because the reality is that there are, uh, the main reason why uh, Ukraine has been able to, uh, to repel and, 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 and to push back the Russian forces is of course the bravery, the courage of the Ukrainian armed forces. Uh, the political leadership, the people of Ukraine. But one uh, important element has also been the fact that NATO allies actually trained and helped Ukraine since 2014. Um, the United Kingdom, uh, the United States, Canada and others uh, provided uh, significant training and capacity building and also equipment uh, from 2014, meaning that the Ukrainian army much, were much stronger, better equipped, better tra trained, better led uh, uh, last year than they were in 2014, and that's at least part of the explanation why they were able to withstand the Russian invasion uh, uh, now uh, uh, in a way they, didn't, uh, they were not able to do in 2014. So we are working on our partnership. We agree that the NATO uh, summit to step up uh, the partnership and support for uh, Ukraine. But I urge NATO allies to do more uh, because it is an urgent need uh, to support those partners uh, who are vulnerable uh, for uh, Russian uh, aggression. Secretary General, thank you so much. This has been a, such an important conversation about making sure that Finland and Sweden, full members in NATO, more support for Moldova, 100%. And I think Tobias's words are, are absolutely clear. The to-do list is massive, but historical times require historical decisions. My last one second question to you, Secretary General. American presidents have a tradition of writing a letter to their successor with their words of wisdom. At some point, we're gonna choose your successor. What words of wisdom in 30 seconds would you give your successor? So keep Europe and North America together. Uh, and I don't believe in uh, Europe alone. I don't believe in uh, North America alone. I believe in North America and Europe together, and that's NATO. Amen. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.